Welcome to Resilient Minds 365, where we discuss the resilient stories of entrepreneurs, professionals, and students with mental illnesses to encourage you to strive, thrive, and live in abundance. I'm your host, Cleone Crawford. Welcome to Resilient Minds 365, where we discuss the resilient stories of entrepreneurs, professionals, and students with mental illnesses to encourage you to strive, thrive, and live in abundance. I'm your host, Cleone Crawford. Well, guys, we're doing a little different interview today. Today, we have an interview with guest speaker, Dr. Alex Giacomo. Who is she? Well, Dr. Alex the Giacomo is riding her bike across Canada to raise awareness for children's mental health. She started her journey on July 22nd from Vancouver, BC, and has already made it across four provinces and will be arriving in Toronto on September the 2nd. The goal of this journey is, is threefold. One, raise awareness. Two, um, two, raise funds, which support charities that fund mental health. And three, share psychoeducation. So with that said, I'm going to show you a quick little video, promo video of Dr. Alex and her her fundraising campaign. See you soon. This summer I'm taking on a challenge. I'm biking across Canada, 40 days, 7,000 kilometers in distance and 75 kilometers in elevation. The weather will be wild and I will definitely face obstacles along the way. So why am I doing this? because I'm on a mission to help solve a massive problem. There she is. I'm a registered clinical psychologist. I spend my days providing high quality psychological care to kids, teens, and parents who are struggling with all kinds of problems. Anxiety, overwhelming big feelings, trauma, and unhelpful behaviors. Here's the best part of my job. The majority of the time, treatment really works. Kids see firsthand what happens when they face their fears their worries get smaller and their capacity gets bigger. They get brave. Here's what I know. Effective interventions change the trajectory of kids' lives. Sounds perfect, right? Wrong. Back to the massive problem. It's accessibility. Costs are too high, weights are too long. I've had families on my wait list for up to two years. Even if you adjust for COVID, it's too long. And these are the families who can afford private care. Spoiler alert, most families cannot. So what does this mean? What's the impact? The Canadian Mental Health Association estimates that 70% of kids and families aren't getting the mental health care they need. And post-COVID, that number is probably higher. Even for the kids who can eventually access appropriate treatment, what we know from the data is that delayed intervention can lower parents' actual ability to cope and ultimately lead to worse outcomes overall. Here's the bottom line. I think that kids and parents across this country deserve better. So I'm facing my own fears and hopping on my bike. Along the way, I'll be fundraising and putting the spotlight on 10 charities Two, raising awareness about this key fact. There are psychological treatments that work and most kids don't have access to them. Three, sharing knowledge. 40 videos, one for each day on the bike to equip you with digestible, actionable, and science-based information. Will you join me? Let's make a difference together. So now that we know what Dr. Alex does and her, and her current campaign, let's start with the interview. Hi, I am so excited to be on here. And actually, it's a rare rest day for me. So I've been on the road most of the days since July 22nd. But I because I was on your going to be on your podcast, I was like, Oh, we need a rest day. So I'm doing pretty well. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me. Awesome. Awesome. So Dr. Alex, tell us a little bit more about what you do and why you got started. Sure. So I'm a I'm a clinical psychologist out in Vancouver beautiful Vancouver, BC. And I spend my days with kids, teens, and families who are struggling with anxiety, OCD, behavioral behavioral things, trauma, all kinds of things. And I I love my job, actually. A lot of people ask me, oh, it must be, it must be difficult. It must be hard. But um, it's one of the most energizing things in my life because I basically, I get a front seat to the most challenging, but also the most beautiful moments um, in people's lives. So I basically get a front seat to 
people doing brave things and and often getting better. So that's what I do day in and day out. I'm in a private practice out there in, in Vancouver. Mm-hmm. Um, how I got started, do you wanna know how I got started as a psychologist or how I got started on this bike, which is right there behind me? Both. Okay. So um, I, I, I had a bit of a twisty, turny path to becoming a psychologist. Originally, I did my master's in cognitive science, which is a lot of um, research-based stuff. And I liked it, but I realized then, I, you know what? I miss actually interacting with human beings, people. And so I transitioned into the clinical psychology program, thinking that I would work with adults um, because I, I was not familiar with children. I never really wanted to do anything with children. But of course, you know, in that first year, you have to pick a practicum and you you rank your choices. And the la- my last choice was a child practicum. And of course, that's the one that I got. And <laughs> I, I don't know if it's fate or whatever you want to call it, but I, I just fell in love with it. It was um, a camp for kids with selective mutism, which is an anxiety disorder where kids are able to speak only in certain situations, which causes problems in schools and and wherever they can't speak. And it was a a one week intensive camp. And at the beginning they couldn't speak and at the end they could. And so it was like, wow, these treatments really, really work. And so I wanted to be part of that and then kind of switch tracks. That was 12 years later and here we are. So that's how that happened. Okay. So how did you start the, what made you decide I'm going to take a bike and I'm going to go across Canada, four provinces at least. What made you do that? Yeah, I can see why you would ask that question because you would think like, why would anybody do that? Mm -hmm. And let me, I'll give you a couple different answers. One of them is, so as a psychologist, what I love Mm -hmm solving problems and helping people feel better. And it would be very easy for me to just kind of focus on the kids that come into the clinic. But that's not the whole story, unfortunately. The people that we see coming into the clinic, that's a small fraction of the kids that really need care. So the reality is, is that three in four kids and teens who need psychological care cannot access it because of long wait lists, and high cost. So this has been a problem at the back of my mind. It's been there for like 12 years. I was kind of hoping it would solve itself, you know, if things would get better as I got through my career. They're not better. They're actually just getting worse. And so I felt compelled to do something about this. So that was in the back of my mind. And then over the holidays, I was back home in Toronto and I was with my best friend's dad and he happened to mention that he had cycled across Canada when his wife passed away from breast cancer in 1993. I was kind of in need of a personal reset. And as soon as I heard him say that, I was like, that's it. That's what I'm going to do. The reason why is I'm not a cyclist. Okay. I'm not really even an athlete, but Mm -hmm. I want to do something really hard because it's a metaphor for the challenges that kids and families are facing in this country right now, not because of mental illness, because they're alone in their Mm -hmm. mental struggle. So it's like, it's not even the mental health struggle that's the primary problem. The primary problem is that they're alone and they can't access care. So what they're facing is is uncertain and insurmountable, just like riding your bike across the country when you don't have a bike and uh, you don't really know how to ride a bike. So I just, that was why. So those are, those were like the motivations at the back of my head back in January. Okay. Well, that makes sense there. (laughs) I'm glad you decided to take on this challenge. So my next question is, so I think you actually answered about your training in psychology. You did um, a master's, I believe. So the, it's, it's very long. So I have uh, the undergrad from U of T, then there's a two-year master's and then a PhD um, and then a residency after that. Um, So the whole, all in all is, you know, like 10 years post undergrad, which is a a lot of years. That is long, very long, very long. That's good though. I'm glad that you, you know, were committed to the cause for sure. And my next question is, why is it important that we raise awareness for children's mental health? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm glad you asked that. So 
first of all, it's important because right now people feel really alone. And what we know from the data is that you can get through a lot more if you feel supported. So that's just like a very basic reason, right? Like we do not want people to feel alone in anything. We're not, we're not like designed to go through hard things completely alone. So that's one reason. The other reason is this is something that affects a lot of kids, a lot of kids. And if something is affecting kids and teens, it's also affecting their parents. Mm -hmm. And what I believe, I think what everybody agrees with is that kids matter and parents matter. But the way that the system is working and the way that, you know, people experience it, it feels like they don't matter. Right. The other reason we should be raising awareness is there are solutions. And I think this is what people don't really really know. I think when people hear mental illness, kids, teens, I think they automatically consider that to be something that is not really fixable or solvable. And that's just not true. Like we have really, really good treatments. Um, I, I mostly deal with anxiety, trauma, again, OCD, but we have really good treatments at work. So if more people know that, A, this is a problem, a lot of people experience this, and there's something that we can do about it, mm -hmm. um, that's just going to make things a lot easier for a lot of people. And I'll just say one other thing, it's especially important to raise awareness for child mental health because kids and teens are constantly developing, right? Like a two-year-old doesn't do the same things as an eight-year-old, doesn't do the same things as a 12-year-old. So if you have a mental health struggle at a certain age, but you don't get help until five years later, all the developmental milestones in between point A and point B are affected. So you're not just affected by the mental health stuff, you're affected by how that changes your development. So the trajectory of your life is then altered. But if you can get help, we can avoid all of that. So those are the, those are the reasons I think we should be raising awareness. Definitely, definitely, definitely. And what made you decide to start this bike marathon? What has been your success so far since you began? I think you answered that question. Mm -hmm. So we'll move to the next question. What are some things you notice that our children are suffering from? Yeah, so like I said, most of what I see um, is kind of in the anxiety box. So, you know, separation anxiety, social anxiety, OCD, that kind of thing. So I think broadly what I would say is there's a lot of fear. And um, I think when kids have a lot of fear, that means parents also have a lot of fear. Because what we know about emotions, especially in close relationships, is that they're contagious. They're like shared. So then you don't just have a kid that's scared. You have like a whole family that's scared. And then you have anxiety kind of bossing around a whole family system and then that gets things you know really out of whack so there's fear from kids and then for parents there's fear that their kids aren't going to be okay or that there's something really 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 wrong with them and then you can see how that would spiral and spiral so if I had to sum it up in one word it's anxiety fear and anxiety okay that makes sense all right and how can therapy help children yeah, so um, we, you probably heard the phrase um, evidence-based. So ev we know that there are some therapies that are evidence-based, which means they've been studied by researchers and they've been shown um, to actually work. So for example, when it comes to anxiety, one of the key ingredients that we know helps is something called psychoeducation. And what that means, it's just knowledge about anxiety. So for example, one of the things that people think about anxiety is that it's dangerous. Okay, so like imagine a kid with school anxiety. They can't go to school. They haven't been to school in months because they're too scared. Parents come into their bedroom in the morning and they're like, okay, we have to get to school. And the kid starts crying, hiding under the covers, saying, no, I can't. I'm too scared. I'm too scared. So often in that moment, parents might think, oh, they're in danger. I need to protect them. I can't let them go to school because they're so scared. And so there's this belief that the experience of anxiety is innately dangerous or harmful. And that's actually not true. So anxiety is, act is normal. All of us experience it in some situations or another. It exists on a continuum. Our fear alarm is important. Like if we're being chased by a bear, we should be scared. That's good. That helps us like do the right thing. 
But the problem is sometimes with, with some of these kids and teens and adults, the fear alarm is just too sensitive. It just goes off when it doesn't need to go off. It's like um, this example, if you're cooking and I don't cook very well, but if you're cooking and the smoke alarm goes off, mm -hmm. would you, because you burned it, let's say, cause you burned a piece of toast or something, you right. wouldn't run out of the apartment and call the fire, you, you like call the fire department because you know, it's just cause you burned a piece of toast. But what kids and parents are doing is they're, they're treating some of these anxious symptoms as if it's a, a real danger. So what the psychoeducation does is it t teaches you like, oh, actually, wait, no, it's okay. It's uncomfortable. It doesn't feel good, but it's a false alarm. It's a false alarm. So we need to treat it differently than a real alarm. And one of the best ways to actually handle it is to face fears in small steps. That's what we know works. So we know that when you avoid things, they get bigger. And when you face things, they get smaller. So it's like, that's just a snippet of, of one of the effective treatments for, for anxiety and what we would do for kids when they come into the office. Okay, perfect. If you could talk to a policymaker or someone who can implement programs to assist children, what would you tell them? I would empathize with them because I think their job is very, very hard. The system, it's a complicated system. There are a lot of shortcomings, you know, in the system. Um, so I their situation, but I would tell them that probably prevention is really important because if we can give people proper education about how to be with our thoughts and feelings and the stories we tell ourselves in healthy ways, mm -hmm. it's really going to offset problems down the road. So I would probably say, listen, we got to really be focused on prevention here and we got to get creative about being able to meet the needs that people have when it comes to mental health care. So I would, I would like talk, I would talk to them a lot about how this is important. Like we got to get, we got to change things up here. We got to, we got to get people the, the help that they need. Definitely. Definitely. So with that said, we're now going to take a switch to the interview just a little bit. As you can see behind me, there's a book that says the music of my life. Well, that's a book about my journey with mental health and bipolar and music therapy. So my question to you, this is a question about music therapy. What are your thoughts about music therapy? Mm -hmm. And I'm, oh, thank you for, for sharing that. I, I took a peek at the the summary of, of the book, but I'm looking forward to picking it up and, and have so glad that music therapy helped you, helped you so much. So I, I myself, I don't do, I don't provide music therapy because I am a terrible musician. Um, but <laughs> what I will say is, is there's something so healing about music, right? Like some pain in life is too hard to put into words. And sometimes like when we hear really beautiful music, it kind of like reaches a place that we just can't get to with words. And so I have so much respect for creative people who can make excellent music. Um, and I relate very much to people who, yeah, who, who benefit from music itself. So I can't speak to music there because I, I don't provide it, but I absolutely, I, you know, I can, uh, I can acknowledge that there's something very, very special and healing um, about the right music for the time that you're in. Yeah. Okay. Well, if you were to think of a song that best describes your journey with children, what would it be and why? This is okay. This is a tough one for me because, and I wish I was not this way, but I'm like one of those people who I only listen to music if someone recommends it to me. Like for some reason, I don't have the skill of going out and find my own music. And I wish I did, <laughs> but I like kind of rely on other people to tell me what to listen to. Um, so the first thing that came to mind for me, and I kind of want to know what you think about this, but it was, it's, it's that song by Miley Cyrus called it's the climb do you know that song no i i don't know the song but i know wrecking ball but it's the climb sounds okay okay yeah. it's a climb yeah and uh she, basically she's just talking about how like th things are hard but there are things that you learn in the climb right and and it kind of speaks to this idea that like we can't avoid or escape suffering and pain unfortunately in this life and at the same time, somehow there's some beauty in that. Um, yeah, that's mm -hmm. kind of the sentiment of the song. 
Cool. I like it. I like it. I like it. All right. So my um, doctor, how can we stay in touch with you? What are your social media handles? Yeah, um, it's funny. I wasn't on social media a lot before this bike ride, but of course I'm on there now because I'm trying to document as much as I can um, mm -hmm. about this very wild ride that I've been on. So I'm on Instagram. It's um, at dr for doctor Alex, A-L-E-X, D-I-G-I-A-C. Dr. Alex D. Jack on Instagram is the probably the best place to find me. Perfect, perfect. And do you have any final words of inspiration for our listeners? Sure. I would, I guess I would just like to say, I'm sure people can relate to the feeling of being stuck and like overwhelmed in terms of where you want to go. Mm -hmm. And I think I like, I think I would just like to say, one thing that I believe even more after this bike ride is that you don't have to have all of the answers to a big problem before you start moving in the direction of a solution. And I think a lot of life comes down to how we deal with uncertainty. Uncertainty makes a lot of us very anxious. We don't tolerate it very well, but life is uncertain. A lot of life is uncertain. So I think what I have, what I know from the research and what I have found personally is that there is magic in taking a first step in, in uncertainty, even when you do it scared and you can count on a snowball effect and momentum building and hope rising. If you can just take a first step. Cool. I like that. I like that. Perfect. Well, Dr. Alex, it's been a pleasure having you as a guest on our show. Thank you very much for coming on our show. Thank you so much for having me. I know you made a bit of an exception. It's a different than your regular show, but I'm so grateful. Thank you. It was great to meet you. No problem. So, and to all you resilient minds until, out there, until next time, please subscribe to us on all our platforms. And don't forget to rate the show and leave a review for us on Apple Podcasts. Also join the community Resilient Minds and sign up for our monthly newsletter at www.cleonicrawford.com. Be sure to grab a copy of my book, The Music of My Life, on all Amazon market marketplaces to get to know me better. And if you can think of one person that will receive value from today's show or connect with Dr. Alex's testimonial, please share it with them. Feel free to take a screenshot of this week's episode of the podcast and tag us on Instagram. You can tag myself at OnlyCleone or Resilient Minds 365 and today's guest at Dr. Alex D-I-G-I-A-C. And remember, mental health is not a death sentence. Despite your illness, you can strive, thrive, and live in a life of abundance. Until next time, I'm Cleone Crawford, and I'm signing off. Oh, 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 oh,